again here today as we continue in our study of the fundamentals of the church. Today we're getting into a really big subject, um, and that is marriage and the family. So why don't we have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our time together. Dearly Father, just ask you to be with us here today as we open up your word, as we study the subject of marriage and the family. I just ask that you would guide us through this conversation, Lord, as we look in our world today. There are many that are struggling in their marriages. There are many that are having uh, hardships in their family relationships, their children. And so, Lord, I just ask you to be with us here today as we look at what the Bible says, its guidance, as you direct us here now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this is a really big subject. I, I kind of wrestled with what is the best approach? This could really turn into a marriage and family seminar. Uh, and I'm kind of just looking at it just from our study here today. Um, I think the best place to start really is just to look at Jesus as the model. Uh, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, it says that I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To me, that's all of it right there. As far as your marriage is concerned, if Christ is first, right? And in your family, Christ is first. And you want Christ to live both in you individually as well as within your marriage and within your family. If you're struggling in many ways, that's to me the first place that you should go to. Is say, what is Jesus in our relationship? Is he truly center? You know, do you pray together? Do you spend time in his word? Do you spend time in church? Is Christ really the center of your marriage and your family? And what you find is, again, notice what it says. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. So in the marriage relationship, who's first? You know, oftentimes we say, well, this is what I want. Well, hold on a second. Let's back up here a moment. Christ is the foundation. What does he want in your relationship, in your marriage, in your family? Jesus has set the bar. And we need to have a more selfless attitude in both our marriages and in our families. And as far as Jesus is concerned, how far was he willing to go for that? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, love suffers long. Love suffers long. Christ went to the distance, didn't he? He died for you and me. How much are you willing to go through. You know, we say that when we get married, uh, till death do us part, but is that the reality? If we look in our world today, is that the reality that we find? Here, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 4, it says, love suffers long. It doesn't stop there. It says, love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Uh, it says, love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Is that the reality of the love relationship that we find in many marriages today or in the family today? How far are they willing to go? If Jesus is the model for you and for me, then we do need to, as we've just said, have a more selfless attitude. Let me just talk about this a moment. Love suffers long. Now, you look at the marriage statistics. I went on the CDC. And the, the most recent one, the data I could find was 2018. And it gives the number of marriages, which is uh, about 6.5 per thousand uh, is the average. This is in the United States. And the divorce rate 
is 2.9 per thousand. So what does that show you? That shows you a 40 to 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. Actually, I did some more look at the data. Not only do 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce, but 60% of the second marriages end in divorce. And one of the things that you find is that researchers have identified the most common reason people give for their divorces is lack of commitment. 73% said this was the major reason that led to their divorce. Lack of commitment. The Bible says love suffers long. Now we're going to unpack this a little bit because we have to understand of that that level of commitment is is twofold, right? It's not just commitment one one way. Oftentimes people will say the single biggest the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Sometimes we'll say that I've communicated how I feel, but has the other person communicated how they feel? And what kind of communication is being used? Are we receptive? Are we listening to what that person is, is telling us? But we see here 40 to 50% of marriages are, are ending in divorce. And the reason why there's a lack of commitment. Again, Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. You know, a lot of times people will go to things like Matthew 5, verse 32, and they'll say sexual immorality, cheating, um, immoral acts, adulterous acts. You can go on and on and on. These things give me permission, give me the right to get divorced. They give me the grounds to get divorced. And even though that is true, should that be our reaction? That is the reaction of many today. And there's other reasons, as I said, because of this lack of, of commitment. I mean, even Revelation, or not Revelation, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. And it goes on to talk about sexual immorality and adulterous uh, behavior. You can even go and add to this list. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 15, talks about an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife. This isn't talking about being unequally yoked. That is a different conversation as when you are choosing a mate of not being unequally yoked. And there's a lot of important reason for that. But this is, you know, a husband and a wife, they get married. Then all of a sudden, at some point, the wife uh, has a relationship with Jesus and is converted. And then the husband, though, does not want to hear it and continues to be unbelieving and will not, will not, will not. If it comes to the point where the husband says, I will not, I believe the Bible gives you grounds for divorce. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So the question, though, becomes is this. What is that lack of commitment, as we just talked about? 73% say it's a major reason. We have to look at it from both perspectives. If the husband or wife says, I don't want to change, I'm not going to change, to me, that is abandonment. That is this lack of, of commitment. And so that gives you permission, I believe, biblically, to say divorce. You know, if I've, but if I've got somebody who has sexual immorality or adulterous relationships or unbelieving or whatever you want to say, if they are willing to change, if they're open to change, if they're trying to change, if they're improving or enhancing or deepening their relationship with Jesus and they're fighting through this, then I believe that the Bible does not give you grounds. Because again, remember what it says, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God is the model for you and me, and both parties are wanting to make it work, then any of these things don't automatically mean divorce. I mean, God shows us. I'll give you another example. In Jeremiah chapter 3, Israel is being seen as the whore. Okay, Israel is a whore. 
And in Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, even though she is playing the harlot, even though she's the whore, here, here, listen to this. Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Verse 13 is the clue. Only acknowledge your guilt. Verse 14 then says, Return, O faithful children, declares the Lord, for I am your master, and I will take you. See, part of this reality in our marriages is not just immediately to get divorced because there's hardship in your life. 40 to 50% of marriages are ending in divorce because there is a lack of commitment. But is it both ways? And what I find oftentimes it's not. It's one spouse or the other says that there's a lack of commitment. And the other one is, you know, whatever their reason may be. And they're not looking to communicate with each other, really communicate with each other, really work through these things to make things right, to actually acknowledge your guilt. And again, a lot of times that happens because the individual is very self-oriented. They're not selfless. That's what we talked about before. And so again, we need to be or have a desire to make things right versus I guess you could call it abandonment, that you are unwilling. And, and what does God do ultimately with those people? If you have an unwillingness to come back, if you are not seeking restoration, then God, in essence, lets you go. I mean, he loves you. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants all to have everlasting life. But you and I have a choice. We can choose. We have free will. And if that person chooses to walk away, if that person chooses not to make things right, if that person is, in essence, choosing to abandon you, then I believe that gives you the right to move on. Again, are we willing to suffer along? That's a very important thing. And I, and I think this really, this transcends marriages. This isn't just within the marriage. This should be the model of our family. You know, for our children, for our relationships. Are we willing to suffer long? Are we willing to be kind, even though someone is unkind? Are we going to retaliate when we are provoked? Are we going to return evil with evil? Or are we going to be willing to endure? Again, the question becomes in our marriage, how much do you endure? If that spouse that is, is provoking you and being evil to you and is puffed up and is is unkind and is rude and is not seeking to change, God does not expect you to continue to stay there when that person is treating you this way. There's nothing in scripture that says that. And so it's very clear for us. Let me see. Let me show you another one here. If you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians. This one's a very abused passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, where uh, verse 22, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, I'll hear a lot of different sermons and positions that are are stated about wives submitting to their husbands and so they start to unpack what it means to submit how far are you willing to submit i'm just supposed to stay there in this relationship while you abuse me and don't take care of me and are un unmerciful to me and all these things and i'm just supposed to stay there and take it that's ludicrous. That is not what the Bible teaches. And so it's important for us to recognize what's the context of this submission that we're talking about here. Notice what it says. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. Now, there's something that's really important that we got to miss here. Go back to verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. And notice what the key words are right afterwards as to the Lord. This reminds me of the story in the Old Testament of Hannah. Remember the story of Hannah? She comes and she prays the Lord. She's in essence submitting and surrendering to the Lord. Lord, I want a child, please, if you would only give me a son. And then she goes on in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11, 
she says, if, if this happens, I will give him to you and he will be yours for his entire lifetime. We've got to look at this word submit to your husbands through our relationship with Christ. Okay. This is not just submit for the mere fact of submission. Okay. This is not to beat down an individual like many define submission. Okay. This is submission through our relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to have a relationship with him for our lifetime. And so this submission, this relationship that a husband has with his wife is also through the model of love. Okay. This submission is through love, through kindness, through a behavior that cares for them, that's uplifting to them, that's not self-centered or puffed up. Okay that endures and loves. And so it's important for us to see that this way. So many have distorted this. What's it say in verse 25? Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And so this submission is a surrender. This submission is a loving relationship that a spouse has and it's important for us to see it through that lens. And even goes on there, if you notice in verse 31 of Ephesians 5, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be enjoined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. You know, this is kind of a sad situation today, is that so many outside of the marriage relationship are becoming one flesh in one in one way. There's a lot of different ways to unpack what this one flesh means, and I'm going to do that here in just a moment. But there are so many in our world today that are in one way becoming one flesh with multiple people and not realizing what is actually taking place as a result of that oneness with them. And and I think our world really has it backwards. Let me let me share this with you here. And again, I've, I've had people tell me this that are either preparing for marriage or in dating that tell me that, oh, well, in preparing for marriage, they had to have multiple partners sexually to make sure that that person was the right person for them. And it, it's just incredible, mind boggling to me of, of people's mindset. Let me, let me kind of share one aspect of this one flesh. When in the human body, two people become one, there is a release of, of hormones that takes place. One of those is what's called oxytocin. It's kind of a, kind of a feel-good kind of hormone. It doesn't just happen during sexual uh, relations. It also can happen in other ways, too, through touch and, and through feeling. But and, and, and it, it literally forms kind of a trust and, and an emotional bond that happens as a result. And it's, incre it's, uh, it's uh, released in both men and women. And even though we do find it uh, more strongly by women during uh, the uh, sexual intercourse because of estrogen, uh, it's, it's enhanced. Men, they have what's called vasopressin uh, that's also released. And, and I'll talk about that in here in just a moment. So I was looking at this study dealing with oxytocin and the vasopressin and the hormonal connection that happens. So let me just read this to you. Uh, Dr. Rene Perlman is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Bonn in Germany. So this is a few years uh, old, but not long. So let me just read this to you. So under the influence of oxytocin, two areas of the brain responsible for feeling of reward and pleasure lit up when a man saw his partner's face. They end up taking this thing and they, they put other faces on there, but there was the most increase, the real most pleasure when they showed their partner's face. Uh, the sight of other women really gave an opposite effect. They found that there was a suppression of the feelings of pleasure. It was quite interesting. 
And this, this study went on to say that the oxytocin triggers the reward system to activate on the partner's face uh, the presence of, of the partner. So now here's where the problem happens. If you have multiple partners, right, then you're really, it's, it's counterproductive. If you've only had one partner, then you're only connecting with that one partner. Then if you're having multiple partners, you're connecting with multiple partners. And it's really, as I say, counterproductive. One of the things that happens is that men, now women do this too, and this isn't 100%. This is things that we find happening, that men tend to imprint on their early sexual experiences. So, and this is again, prior. Now, again, we wanna look at it within the marriage relationship. He's imprinting on his first sexual experience, it would be his wife, which is big, okay? As we just saw of the effects of the oxytocin and as well the uh, vasopre uh, vasopressin, I think is what I said, yes, vasopressin. As he's imprinting on premarital relationships, he's in essence imprinting on the lust. He is imprinting on the sex rather than on the girl, the woman, okay? And, and this is really a, a bad thing because if you're imprinting on those early sexual experiences, what happens later on in the marriage relationship is you are actually wanting this wife to be those early imprints that you had in your sexual experiences. And so many times you'll want your spouse, maybe not your wife, your spouse, woman or man, to do those things that you are imprinting on early on. I, I heard a, a, an example of this from a study that was done uh, where a husband was not having uh, an attraction or, or wanting to have sexual relationships with his wife. And through the conversation, the question was asked him if he had had premarital sex prior to his wife, and he had. And they asked him to describe this premarital relations. And he talked about how he would go, take them out to dinner, go to motels, and do all this kind of stuff. And then when he began to describe what turned him on with his wife was going out to eat and going to a motel. So he found that what he was imprinting on early on in many of his sexual experiences, he was then wanting with his wife. If he had imprinted on her in the beginning, then the things that he would have formed with her would be the things that he would continue and you would never have that problem. That's why I keep telling people all the time that you are counterproductive in having premarital relationships. Now, can you undo these things? No, you can't. Can you work through these things and get through these things? Yes, but it's gonna take work. Women also imprint on men, but oftentimes that imprint is after the sexual experience. But if you've got a man who's had multiple partners, there is, no, there is no imprint, or you're imprinting on something that you really don't want to imprint after the sexual experience because there's no emotional connection that's happening for the man afterwards. Because again, it's focused on the sex and not the woman. And so oftentimes as a result then, these women are imprinting on this, so it ends up impacting their self-being, their self-image, and their self-image continues to go down. And what do they do? They continue to search for men and they give men the sexual experience, not realizing that it's counterproductive to their relationship. They think that through the sexual experience, they're gonna reach the man's heart, but it's not. And it's actually not doing what they want. And so they keep searching for love, not realizing that the sex is not the solution. One of the things I saw too is that men tend to have two and a half times on average the brain space devoted to sexual drive in their hypothalamus. So what happens if the woman has sex with a man outside of marriage 
it satisfies his drive, but again, it doesn't really come to the solution that what they're looking for. And so this oneness is best when it's within the marriage relationship, because now you're imprinting on each other. Your sexual experiences are learning from each other and everything is the way God planned it. See, when God created Adam and Eve, they were for the purpose of imprinting on each other. One flesh in many ways, lifelong. It's very important. Let me read this to you. Marriage was divinely established in Eden and affirmed by Jesus to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman in a loving companionship. For the Christian, a marriage commitment is to God as well as to the spouse and should be entered into only between a man and a woman who share a common faith. Mutual love, honor, respect, responsibility are the factor of this relationship, which is to reflect the love, sanctity, closeness, and permanence of the relationship between Christ and his church. So this kind of brings us into the family component. If two people get married, again, this oneness that we talked about, there's a sexual component to that, but there's more to that. There's a spiritual component. If, if a wife who is in a love relationship with Jesus and has a certain core value, okay, or values, let's say they're Seventh-day Adventist, and she marries a man who is not Seventh-day Adventist or does not share the same core values or spiritually does not attend church where the wife attend churches. I've seen this, where the wife will then bring the child with them to church. The husband does not come to the church. What happens to that child? Because the second component of that oneness, one flesh, is also to be fruitful and multiply. What will happen to that child? As that child is raised, will that child stay connected to the mother's core values in the church? Or will that child gravitate towards the father's core values that are in the church? See, this creates a lot of problems. If two are not equally yoked when they get married, it causes severe, severe problems within the family relationship. Because oftentimes what you find is that kids will move towards the place that has less friction. And oftentimes in a church setting, in a spiritual setting, there is more friction. Because in my love relationship with God, there are certain things that I do. And there are certain things that I don't. If I, I remember one time I had a, a young man that was in a, when I, years ago when I was doing youth ministry, and this young man was attending this Bible study, and all of a sudden he stopped coming. And I saw him several weeks later and asked him what was going on. I said, is there something we said? No, I loved it. So there was nothing negative in the, in the time. No, no, I, I loved it. The problem was, is that I was living this life, doing these things. And when I was in this and I heard these things, even though I knew they were right, they were contrary to the life that I was living. And, and I didn't want to give up the life that I was living. And so it was easier for me to stay away from your group because then I didn't feel guilty about the life that I was leaving or le le uh, leading. That's what happens in our children. Our children will find that path that makes them feel best. And oftentimes that is with the spouse that doesn't have the spiritual connection with the church. You find it, it's, it's statistically shown that by the time kids get out of high school or in the latter parts of their high school year, 17 or so, they leave the church. They're gone because the church, in essence, God, holds them accountable for their behavior. And so they don't have to be a part. I don't want to be a part of the church because I can do what I want and not feel guilty about it. And so being equally yoked is really important. And if you're planning on getting married, you should make sure that the person that you're going to marry has the same core values that you do is equally yoked. Or it will. 
And I remember this was an important thing that someone told me years ago when I was preparing to be married, is that you marry the person based on who they are presently, now, not what they might be. Because that person isn't guaranteed to be the person that you hope they might become. You don't marry somebody, if you have the core value spiritually with God, you wouldn't marry somebody with the hopes that I believe that someday they will. That is not always the case. You should marry them based on who they are now, not what they might become in the future. And so it's important for us to recognize this, not only in our own choices in who we are going to marry, but also the impact that will have on the children that we have, because we have a responsibility for our children. It's very important that we do that. You know, and it's interesting. Um, let, me, let me share some more things about this family component. I remember reading once that parenting is sometimes like looking both ways to cross the road and then getting hit by a plane. We can do all the things that we can to prepare, but we truly can never prepare for what we're going to see. You can't say, well, I did that with this child, and I will use that on this child, because what works for them will work for them. They're, those things are not always true. I've always believed that managing our own health is critical in managing the health of our children. They are sponges, and if you and I don't have a spiritual healthiness, then neither will our children. If you and I do not have core values, then neither will our children. Our children are going to learn from us. They're going to. And what happens in our world today is that many parents say, I'm just going to throw my kids in front of the television, or I'm going to just throw my kid with the electronics. But the problem is, is that is not the appropriate way to rear our children. Do you really want your child to be raised by the type of television programs that are being shown today? The kind of video games and electronics that are being shown today? That should not be the primary place that our children are learning from. But we find that kids are spending hours, hours on their electronic devices and watching television per day which shows that they're having more of an impact by the world than they are by us. You know, what, for instance, whatever happened to this statement, go play outside, right? When I grew up, man, I spent the majority of my time playing outside. The only time I came inside to play was probably when it rained. If it was snowing, I was outside playing. If it was a nice day, I was outside playing. You couldn't get me inside. I was constantly wanting to go outside. Yet today, so many of our kids go outside and play. I'd rather stay inside. No, get out. Kick them out. Get them outside to play. Whatever happened with that? Whatever happened to, you know, eating together? We're in such a fast-paced world today, fast food, that we don't even have tables where we sit down and eat as a family. What happened to the family connection that takes place at the dinner table? It's vanished from many homes. It's important for us to have that family time together. It's important for us to be playing outside. We need quality time together. A husband and a wife need quality time together. They become one as a result. Remember we just read that earlier. They leave their mother and father and they cleave to each other, they become one. Not only does a husband and wife need time together, quality time together, but the family unit needs quality time together. If it's going for walks, if it's going camping, if, whatever, you can come up with whatever you want. Find ways to have quality time together. It's interesting, you go back to the story of Hannah and Samuel. She made the choice because of her relationship with God, to give Samuel to the Lord for his whole life. And the man that was with Samuel that she gave him to was the high priest, Eli. Even though Hannah gave Samuel to the Lord, 
the man that she gave him to or had charge over in this story was Eli. How was Eli doing with his own children? You read the story. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Eli's sons, that says, were scoundrels. They had no respect for the Lord. They wouldn't listen to their father. They made themselves vile. And it says that Eli could not restrain them. Eli wasn't doing the work that he should have. Let me read to you. This is a book called Patriarchs and Prophets. On page 575, this is what it says. Eli was an indulgent father, loving peace and ease. He did not exercise his authority to correct the evil habits and passions of his children. Rather than contend with them or punish them, he would submit to their will and give them their way. Does that sound familiar? If any of you have ever shopped in Walmart before, you ever see kids that get their own way? Man, I've seen kids rolling on the floors, throwing temper tantrums, being pushed through the stores, screaming, screaming at the top of their lungs. It goes on to say here that Eli, instead of regarding the education of his sons as one of the most important of his responsibilities, he treated the matter as of little consequence. I've heard people say to me, oh, I just want to be their friend. I don't want them to hate me. I want them to like me. It's important for us to also recognize that we are their parents. I find, I'll give you another example. Years ago when I worked in the residential facility, and I've had this on more than one occasion, but I'll give you just one example. I had a boy there, very troubled, very troubled kid. He ended up leaving the program, and years later, I would stay in contact with him through Facebook. He had reached out to me, and from time to time, he would share things with me, tell me his struggles. And one day, he said to me, I wish I could go back. And I said, what? You hated it there. All you ever wanted to do was get out, get out, get out. And he said to me, yeah, but since I've left, I've not been able to have any structure in my life. If I had structure in my life, I could be more successful. He saw structure as important to his success. It's the same thing for our children. Our children need structure. They need discipline. They may not realize it, but it's going to lead to success. It's important for us to realize that. Children, watch how we interact with our wives with our husbands. If they see us talking about Jesus, they see us interacting, is it okay for us to have arguments? Yeah, it can happen. But our children also need to hear us say, make it right. I am sorry. Our children need to see both. It's okay. I, I don't know why people always say, I should never have an argument in front of the kids. I've always had trouble with that. I'm not talking about screaming and yelling and throwing knives and pots and pans. I'm not, that's not what we're talking about here. You can have a disagreement with your spouse, but your kids should also see that you come and communicate with each other and come to an actual compromise or you come to a solution. Your children need to see that process. It's important. It's very important. We need to model this. Jesus modeled this for us. We need to model this for our children. Because by beholding, we become changed. And by beholding, our, chi our children become changed. There is so I could turn this into a long uh, actual discussion as we discuss family relationships and, and the relationship between husband and wife. But it's so important, as I've said from the very beginning, that the core value, the, the foundation of our marriages and our families is Jesus. And when I go to scripture, he is the model for you and for me. If you're struggling with some hardships in your life, turn to Jesus. 
Don't try to work it out yourself and make it worse and then turn to him. Turn to him first. Ask him to show you. Pray about it. The Bible gives so many different stories that can assist us, like the story of Hannah, about saying that I want to give him to you for his whole life. Lord, be with me as I raise my child. That it's not like Eli, who didn't exercise the authority that he should have as a father. There are many story after story after story that give us parables or real life situations to help increase our understanding of how we should act as a spouse, as a mother, as a father, and so forth. Well, thank you for joining me here today as we've discussed just a little bit about family and the marriage relationship. Why don't you pray with me as I close our time together? Heavenly Father, we don't have all the answers. Marriage is work. There is no perfect person out there for us to find. It doesn't exist. Marriage takes work. Raising a child, having a family takes work. But we want you to be the center, the core of our relationships. And so I ask that you would continue to grow in our minds, in our hearts, that you would continue to lead us so that we would be the men, women, and children that you would have us be. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. Don't forget, every Saturday morning, we've moved our times. We are now meeting for Sabbath school at 930, and our church service is starting at 1045. I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.